I'm going to point out, but there are a number of these on our walk around, and I'm going to point them out to you. I'm not going to read any of them to you. I will point them out to you and discuss it, but you all can all back, come back and read them. Unless you really need to know what's in, you know, if you don't understand, just let me know. But I will talk about all of them. When the British were here, when the British came in, they took this place and they, they made it bigger. The Spanish had a settlement right here. The British came in, question how the British are, everything had to be just so. So they surveyed the area, they made a larger development, they put in this, this grid of streets. They put in this grid of streets, squared up the blocks, did all that kind of stuff, just to make it a more livable situation. They put a brick wall around the place. Now the southern wall, the southern wall, or the southern part of the fort, was the water, and the water was very close. Bay Street, which is right by, see the car, that tr white truck pass? See the white, that, um, that's where Bay Street was. It was that close. Okay. Now, the eastern wall was across from Seville Square, which is at, across from the Christ Church, the, uh, the parade grounds over there. The wall was on the other side of that. The western wall was across the street from the T.T. Wentworth. Does everybody know where the T.T. Wentworth is? Uh, well, you can't, it, it's the brown building that's two blocks down. You can kind of see it through the trees there. There's a brown mm -hmm. building about two blocks down, and uh, that's where the T.T. Wentworth is. And the northern wall of it kind of peaks up. I think it's the Garden Street. I'm not really sure. But it, this is about uh, five blocks up. But anyway, the most important thing about all this explanation is that there was no fresh water on the inside of the walls. No fresh water. So they started digging a well to get fresh water. And they got down to a whole seven feet and they only got salt water. So they stopped <laughs> digging the well. Fresh water is about a quarter of a mile, half a K, from here, outside of the wall. So that's a long way to go to get fresh water, but that's where the water was. Okay. So this is a, 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 so this well was a big well. Okay. Uh, the first house we're going into is this building right here. Now this building is the only one of the four buildings that we're going into that was moved. The other three are on their original foundations. This building was originally at 111 Government Street, which is a block to the west and a block to the north. It was built in 1805. It would have had things in the yard there, just like you see in the yard here. It would have had an herb garden. They used those herbs to cook with and for medicinal purposes. They would have had a vegetable garden. There's a vegetable garden on the other side. They would have had an outdoor cooking place. Now, not as elaborate as this, because the university uses this for storage. They shelter, like right now it's raining, it's shelter for, these, for the uh, enactors here. Uh, they cook in it on Saturdays, you know, things like that. So that it, for us, it was needed. But back then, it was probably more of just a little round cooking place. They also would have had a uh, storage shed, barn of some kind, something like that. Um, a chicken coop, probably, and also an outdoor cricket. So we're going to the front, to the, uh, to the front steps of the house. Please go down here. Could you take my umbrella down there? I've yep. got the keys. <laughs> in the military. In about 1803, she found out that he had passed away on maneuvers because his military pay stopped going to the house. They had six children. That's the only way she found out. So she needed income. Six children, she needed income. She owned, already owned a piece of land. So she contracted with Charles, who lived a couple of houses down from her on Intendencia Street, to build this house for her. This is a uh, Greek, Greek, no it's not, it's a French colonial cottage style of architecture. Very common in the Gulf South. People moving around would not have had any trouble living in this house. Now this is a duplex. Those two doors there go into one apartment. These two doors go into another apartment. This started a community of interest that she and Charles had in Pensacola that lasted until she passed away in 1829. In 1829 she listed in her last will 27 buildings in Pensacola 
that they were getting lease monies from on a, on a monthly basis. So for a single woman, she did pretty well, pretty good for herself. Can you imagine? I mean, at that time in our history, that was a lot. That, that was a big deal. They had another community of interest, she and Charles. When uh, they built this house in 1805, she was pregnant with her third child by Charles, and she had four more children after that by him. He denied that community of interest. But in about 1808, they and two other investors bought the only brickyard in Pensacola, and they used those bricks to build young Pensacola. By 1812, they were doing so well that they actually bought out the other two investors, gave it to her oldest son, Manuel, to manage for them, and they did, they built most of young Pensacola. They built houses, uh, contract and for concession, and then businesses and all that kind of stuff to, in, in early Pensacola. So they were very active in this area. Uh, this house was built using mortised and tenon construction. I'm going to show you that on the inside. It also uses nogging, and I'm going to show you that on the inside. But you see how smooth this wall is? This is nogging. I'm going to show you that on the inside. As compared to, of course, the, the wall was moved, the building was moved, they had to replace some of the walls that are wooden, and they look just like regular wooden walls. But you'll see what I'm talking about when we go to the inside of the house. <laughs> As I mentioned, this is a, an apartment, and you get two rooms. You get these two rooms. They're 14 foot square for $20 a month is what she got started when she rented them. $20 a month. That's not a whole lot. Yes, I lowered the fence. Uh, uh, but you know, back then, it was a whole lot. I mean, that was a lot of money, $20 a month. That was a whole lot. But we're not talking about people who are very high on the economic ladder that were renting this apartment. Right? We're talking about people who are working in the brickyard, Mariana, you know, on the brickyard, so kind of a different thing. As I mentioned though, on the outside, this house was built using mortise and tenon construction. Mortise is a hole, tenon is a pin. So if you turn around and look up in that corner, you can see the pin on that, the, the, the rafter up there, going into the hole, the, the mortise going into the mortise. Also, if you look at the piece that is above the mantle, see the cross piece above the mantle? You can see the pen sticking out the, the side of the, of the rafter, don't you? Mm -hmm. You see the pen sticking out. Yeah. So that's mortise and tenon construction. So they built the wooden part of the house at the carpenter shop. They marked it with Roman numerals. And if you look in that window that's right over there, in that window, you see the white spot kind of there's a white spot at the top of the rack. If you step back a bit, maybe if you step back, uh, you can see the X's, the X's, yep, X's, X's. which is the uh, Roman numeral, it's, it's actually VXX, oh, yes, yeah, which is 25. And so they marked, you see at the top, so that, that they marked it with Roman numerals, yeah. took it apart, moved it to the homeowner's land site kind of like a Jim Walker home, put it back together using those <laughs> Roman numerals. Then they took brick and mortar, and you can see the brick and mortar here, and put it between the wooden parts, and this is the nogging, right? This is what the nogging is. Then they would put a layer of, of um, mortar on top of that and paint it. And so you can see the colors that Mariana put on the house, that gold and that red, which, cut, which mimics the Spanish flag flying outside. <laughs> so you got two, like I said, you got two rooms for the, for the $20 a month. Then you walk into this working room of the house. You know, it's no hallway or anything like that. It's a working room of the house. This is a rope bed for the parents to sleep on. A very nice, comfortable bed for the parents to be sleeping on. I'm sure all of y'all are familiar with the saying that goes with a rope bed. Sleep tight. <laughs> That's right. And those of you who are not there, it's a key because it's a rope. You see the ropes? Well, the ropes might have to be tightened at some point from sleeping on them. So you go down the way, and you would tighten the ropes all the way down and pull the knife mm -hmm. and tighten them up. And the other part of the saying is, don't let the bed bugs bite because the mattresses were filled with whatever they could get their hands on. Spanish moss, horsehair, reeds from the creek, uh, leaves. They, whatever they could find is what they would stuff in their mattress. Now, well, funny thing that happened one time I was giving the tour. I had some two couples on the tour from either the, the Bahamas or Bermuda, one of the two English islands. And I did this. You know, it's 
Emily Pike, this lady came unglued. She had never, she, her grandmother used to tell her that all the time. All right, baby, you know, sleep tight. You know, don't let the bed bugs back. She didn't know where it came from. I had to let her do this, pulling the mattresses out from underneath the bed. She was on the floor, on her back, taking pictures of the rope and everything because she did not know where that came from. So it was an education to her to do sleep tight and don't let the bed bugs bite. You know, some mosquito netting on our cheese cloth on the bed to spot mosquitoes because there would have been no glass in the windows, no glass at all. And Mariana would, <laughs> could not afford to put glass in the windows. There was no glass maker in Pensacola. So they would just spend the louver openings over the windows. So they would have needed some way to control the, the mosquitoes that over time was here. So that's what they would use because the children would be sleeping on mattresses made the same way. And they would be just wherever they was convenient for the children to sleep. You know, like in July and August, they're probably sleeping on the front porch. January, February, they might be sleeping in the fireplace to stay warm. But they all would have been terrified by mosquito netting when it was the appropriate time of the year. Notice the crucifixes in this room. This house being built in 1805, this Spain, uh, Spain owned Florida. The King of Spain was Catholic, so you could only openly practice Catholicism. That's why we had the crucifixes in here. Mirror on the mantelpiece. Now, why is the mirror on the mantelpiece? Because the mirror reflects light. This house was built without electricity. You put one candle in front of the mirror, it will light up the room instead of having to put candles all over the place. Now also you see the glass dishes on the mantelpiece right there? That's a fly trap. Put a little food in the top, in that little in the trough and put a cork in the top, it flies fly up. They don't fly down. They go underneath the dish to get it to the food, get caught on the inside. But flies don't live very long, you know, a couple of days, so it's like that. I'd like to step into the next room. That's amazing. I've never seen one of those. A blind You know, and I thought they wouldn't have them anymore, but my sister in law has them. She keeps them on her front porch. For real. And she bought them someplace that she has them on her front porch. Amazon? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I didn't ask, but she has them on her porch. Oh, my gosh. See, you know, I just used what you think, but they do. That's fine. I know it's cool. Now sometimes we get large groups in here. Last week, week before last, I had 28 people on the tour. <laughs> wow. 28 people. I mean, that was like, wow, like hurting cats. But anyway, here we have this room. We have this room set up as a kitchen because the lady of the house to put food on the table was going to have to do every step of every job to put food on the table. If she wanted vegetables to feed her family, that means that she was going to have to start the seeds, get the little plants growing, till the ground. Plant those plants, you know, water them, weed the yard, all that kind of stuff. Um, bring them in, process them. How she had enough, you know, uh, can them. However, she would preserve them or feed the feed the family. The table would have been sitting in the center of the room. We have it on the side because, like I said, I had 28 people on tour. We had school groups in here that have that many, so they needed needed off on the side. But she did a lot of her work on that table. A lot of work on that table. And she would be here, she'd be doing her work, and when it was time to eat, she would take a rag and wipe the table off onto the floor, put the food on the table, and then they would stand around the table eating. Now look at this table, if y'all get a chance just to look. See those troughs around the table feet, the feet of that table? Those are ant traps. So she would put sweet water or oil in those traps. Ants would climb into the traps, wouldn't be able to go up the leg and drown in the traps. The top of that table comes off. The top of that table comes off, and she would then... Um, she would do. She would make her bread on the inside of the of the table, and she'd put the put the top back on it. And then when it was her turn to cook, she would take it out into the kitchen outside to the cooking place. Remember, I told you there was an outside cooking place. She would take it outside to the cooking place, and then she would cook the bread. She would bring it back into the house, and she would store it in the panettiere. Did I say panettiere? Did I say it right? That's that wooden thing right there. Pan et tier. Am I saying it right? Et tier. Prison? No. Prison? For the prison, the candle? Pan. For bread? Pan bread? Okay. Bread prison. There's a bread prison. She would store the bread in there. Normally, that would have been hanging over the table, though, here in the center of the room. It would hang mm -hmm. in the center of the room. Very important for it to hang in the center of the room. Now, they did not have bread bags. They didn't have Ziploc bags. They didn't have aluminum foil. You know, oh. the bread's going to get stale. The bread's going to get stale. But if it's hanging in the center of the room, they can see the rats and the mice climbing on it to not 
the rats and the mice off, or maybe they see it moving or something like that. So during the day, they would knock the rats and the mice off like that. But at nighttime, excuse me, they would set out a trap, put some food in the mouse trap, set this trap out, uh, hopefully at nighttime to catch the rats in here. Then in the morning, it would be the job of one of the young mistresses of the household. How old are you? Seven. Perfect. Six, seven, eight years old would take this down to the water, drown the animals that are in it, practice skinning and panning with those dead animals. That have to learn because by the time they're ten, they're out there hunting, fishing, you know, bringing in songbirds, squirrels, supplementing the food. Because by the time they get to be man, what 13, 14 years old, they're in the brickyard working because they have to. Everybody has to work, so you know it's a. It's, all, it's important. Every job is important. Notice this covering on the floor. This is a piece of sailcloth, a real piece of sailcloth, and the renters of the house would have gotten something like this to put on the floor to keep the floor clean. As I told you, the table sitting in the middle of the room, just throw this stuff on the floor. It's a lot easier to clean this than it is to clean that wooden floor. The wooden floor would brush, you know, with a bucket and everything. Very, very difficult to do. Now, see this jar, excuse me, see this jar right here? This jar came from Spain filled with olives and olive oil. The merchants sold the, sold the olives and the olive oil, then they sold the jars. Because where is fresh water? Quarter of a mile. For, that's a long way to go to get water. And guess who's going to go and get that fresh water? Kids. The young mistresses of the house. That's right. You would be ta tasked with going to get that water. Are you going to be real careful what you put in that bucket to bring back to put in the, the water source in the house? Maybe not. Maybe you will. Maybe not. But don't forget that everything in the house wants some of that water too. The rats that are climbing on the bed and the fleas want some of that water also. But they use this water for, all, you know, for the household because you need water in the household. Now, one of the things that they did with this water, and as you, all of you adults know, it's always better to consume wine, beer, or whiskey than it is to drink water because water can make you sick if you're not used to the area. So they would make their own wine, beer, and whiskey with it. So to make wine, they would collect uh, fruit or they would raise fruit. They would need sugar. Sugar was available in a tower that was about three foot tall and uh, very, stuck together with molasses, very large. If you've never seen old sugar, old sugar is large. It's like a quarter, of, granules are like a quarter of an inch long, eighth of an inch wide, very, very large. So she would have to, she would go to the market to get sugar. How much sugar do you need, just like you do today? Do you need two pounds of sugar, five pounds of sugar, 10 pounds, you know, whatever. She would get that amount. She would bring it to the house. Now, if she was gonna make wine, she would take her, her, her mallet, take it apart, there's a pick, knock off how much sugar she thinks she needs, then she would put it in the pet water in the pestle. In the, there's a mortar and pestle here. She would granulate the sugar, put it in the wine bottles, line the wine bottles up this contraption right here. Sorry kids, this is not to make snow cones, it's to make wine. She would line the wine bottles up, put cheesecloth on the top of it, dip her water from the water source into the, this, and let it drip into the wine bottles, cork each, cork each bottle, and she has a vintage in each wine bottle. Notice the items around the fireplace, a lot of them are very similar to the things that we use today, pots and pans that, that, that we use today. One that we don't do very often is churn. I don't think any of us have to churn our own butter anymore, but there's the butter churn. But again, she's gonna, if she wants butter, she has to go and get the milk however she gets the milk. She has to separate the cream from the milk. She has to churn the butter, and then once she churns the butter, you have to press it to get all the water out of, the, out of that. And that's what this is. This is a butter press right here. I like to talk about it because I have one at home. Just like that, the exact same thing. It's just I, from my father's side of the family. I'm so thrilled. The little top of it plunges down to press the water out. Any questions about anything? They sold this house in 1815 for $1,500. It helped them with their building uh, endeavors in Pensacola. It was sold to a single family. That's why there's a door here. There's also a door in the other room between the two apartments. But that single family wanted to make it more of a single family type of building. Any other questions about anything? Yeah, upstairs. The upstairs, this, uh, this stairway was added after 1815 by the single family. Uh, before that, the stairway was on the outside of the house. Mariana had it on the outside, and she did rent the attic out for like a traveling salesman kind of thing, a couple of nights. But the single family moved it on the inside. It's just Right now, it's just a blank attic. Um, what did the single families do with it? I, I don't know. I, 
All I know is that there's an attic up there. Very narrow stairway, so I don't think they could move much <laughs> furniture up there. But they probably would have had an opening on the outside, you know, a big door to, to move anything upstairs like that. Good Can question. I have a question? Yes, sir. Can we go in the attic? I'm sorry? Can we go in the attic? You cannot go into the attic. You can look. If you want to just stick your head around the corner, you can look at other wives. You, I cannot allow you to go into the attic. Mm -hmm. All right? But we're on a time schedule, so let's go out the front door. Now, this time of history, in the early 1800s, 1805, they did bathe about once a month. Oh. Once a month. Going out that little gate right there. Oh, by the way, there's, there's a phone left in the main building, a black uh, cell phone. The girl in the building is holding it for you guys after the tour. Leave the platform. No, I had a number off. It was in that corner. I'll leave stuff all over the this building just for a second. Uh, we're going in this building right here. This is the last building that we go into on the tour. What's very important is that this is the location that the governor picked, the governor, the British governor of Florida when he was here being governor. Now he did not, he ended up not liking the house that was built and he gave it to his single officers to use as a place to sleep, take communal meals, they took their communal regimental meals to had officers in the governor's house. The kitchen for the governor's house was not in the kitchen. Just like 40 years later, the kitchen for that house was not in the kitchen. And for the two exact same reasons. We're in the south, it gets hot in the kitchen, so you don't have the kitchen in the house. And yeah, there's a chance of fire. You have the chance, you have a chance of fire. Now you see the two-story building that's right across the street here? That two story that two-story building was was built in 1888. It took the place of a two-story building that was there during this. Uh, prior to the Civil War, and I'm going to talk about that when we go into Christchurch. So just remember that we're going to talk about this building when we go into Christchurch. But if you look on the side of there's one of those colonial archaeological trail placards on the side of that building that talks about the kitchen that was the, for the governor's house. But right now, see that mustard colored building that's over there on the corner? That's where we're heading to that building. And you can go ahead and step onto the porch if you get there first. Oh, this is a two way street. If you're a car coming, you have to look both ways. <laughs> Go around to the front and get on the, around to the front and step up on. I was just waiting for everybody to make sure I don't lose.
Those are Seville oranges, and they taste like lemons. So they probably would not be very good to, to uh, eat. Mm -hmm. So this house was built in 1871. It was built by Clara Barkley Van Door. It is a Greek revival style of architecture. You see the white columns? And uh, when we leave, or if you want to step out, you'll see the cross hatch on the balustrade. It looks like a, a Greek temple. Kind of looks like a Greek temple. Um, Clara Barkley was born here in Pensacola. She was born the same year that her father built their family home. That was in 1825. That home is still um, with us. It is the last example of brick pier construction in Pensacola. It is three blocks to the east of here called the Barkley House and Garden. Barkley Manor and Garden, Barkley House and something like that. It's not open to the public, though. It's, it's a private entity. Um, but the kitchen for that house is not on the inside of it either. It's a separate building attached by a walkway to the main house. But she was born in 1825. Her father was a ship's chandler here in Pensacola. Very lucrative business to be in in the port city. A ch chandler supplies the ship with what the ship needs, like uh, sail, rope, car, or pitch, uh, repair, bo repair boards for the ship itself. Not cargo, they don't handle cargo. So kind of a lucrative business to be in here. And when she was 15 years of age, Clara married. She married Armand the end of New Orleans and went to New Orleans to live with her husband. But something happened along the way. By 1847, Mr. Vienne had passed away. Clara was back home at Mama's house in 1847. We know she met Eben Dorr in 1847. Eben Dorr was half owner of the sawmill in Baghdad. Baghdad is about 20 miles from here. And he was half owner of that sawmill. In 1848, they married. They eventually had six children, four boys and two girls. But sometime after the Civil War, 1869, 1870, Evan Dorr passed away. Hawk, their oldest son, who was 20 years of age and at university, only one of the children who was over the age of majority, inherited that half interest in the sawmill. So he came home, of course, for the funeral and to inherit that half interest in the sawmill. Eight months later, though, Hawk passed away. <laughs> Mrs. Dorr, the remaining five children who were all under the age of majority, inherited that half interest in the sawmill. She promptly sold that half interest in the sawmill, moved home to Mama's house and built this in 1871. Smack dab in the middle of the Victorian era. Queen Victoria assumed the throne in 1837. She died in 1901. Let's go inside and see how Clara decorated her Victorian home. If I can find the key. decorated in two different spheres. One is the public sphere, anything the public could see. So if the public was walking on the sidewalk right now and could see inside of the house, it's going to be decorated. See in a window, it's going to be decorated. The other sphere is the private sphere, like the bedrooms upstairs. We're going to go upstairs to the bedroom so you'll see the difference between the two. But notice that we walk into this very nice hallway and see how decorated this hallway is. We didn't see this in the first house we were in, the 1805 house, because those people were workers in the brickyard. This person who owns this house had owned half of the saw mill. So a big difference in the social uh, strata of the two people. But notice how, how she decorated here. She even decorated the landing up there on the second floor because you could see that. If you were invited into the home, you could see up there, nice chair right there, window treatment. And so it's going to be decorated because that's just the way that they did it at the time. Look at this hall tree right here. Because when you came to this house, 
like today, a rainy day like today, you would have had all kinds of accoutrements with you, right? You would have had an umbrella or a parasol, a cane, top hat, galoshes, overcoat, and so you would have needed a place to put them that you would have been able to put them on the uh, halter. So if I could step into the parlor, Quite affluent. And to think that we, the university, does not have enough period furniture to put in this house to decorate it like Clara would have had it decorated. I mean, she just would, this would have just been full of furniture because, I mean, we have to have space for people to move. So imagine that they would have had so much more than what, uh, with what we are able to do. But notice that the, the upholstery is matched by the chick furniture in the dining room. She's not going to miss a beat. She's going to use every trick of everything to decorate this house. This fireplace around is a solid slate fireplace around, mimicked by the fireplace in the uh, dining room. And um, it's a catalog item, but still, it's, it's, it shows that she had some, some wealth to do that. This is a coal-burning fireplace which is different than a wood-burning fireplace because coal burns longer, longer, hotter, and cleaner than wood does. So it's a step up from wood, so she's showing off her wealth just by having a coal-burning fireplace. Um, now, she built this house with five jib doors in it. Two of them are in this room. You see these windows right here? These are actually doors. The bottom sash of these doors raises up and is equal to the top sash. And look at the wall. It looks like it's broken. It's not broken. It opens up onto the porch so that you can step out onto the porch to catch a breath of fresh air. That's, so that's what that is for. It's also to help because then the house was built without electricity, so they need everything open during the right time of the year to have, get, get fresh air going in. This mirror right here is a pier mirror, and it comes from the Door family home in Baghdad, and it has multiple uses. One is a mirror, which means it reflects light. Just like in the 1805 house, they had a mirror on the mantel to reflect light. This one reflects light for the exact same reason. The other thing is that it decorates this big expanse of wall. So now Clara doesn't have to have extra pictures on this wall or whatever on this wall. She has this pier mirror. And the other thing I think that it does is that Clara would use this mirror. She would step in front of it and check herself. Because you know, ladies in the Victorian era were not supposed to show off their elbows or their ankles. And so if she was having a soiree, here, you know, and Mabel came to the house, you know, and poor Mabel had her the wrong collar on, or her sleeve was turned the wrong way, or her hair was out. Could Clara take Mabel out onto the porch to chastise Mabel? No. With, unless she was perfect. Clara would have to be perfect, so she would check herself in the mirror just to make sure everything was okay. Girls now in the Victorian era, girls did not have to go to school. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? Boys had to go to school, but girls had to, I know, isn't that terrible? But girls had to stay home and learn how to sew, how to cook, how to clean the floor, how to clean the rug, how to clean the, the upholstery, how to clean these window treatments, how to make these window treatments. They had to learn all that. They had to take music lessons. They had to go outside and plant gardens. So girls, they had a lot of stuff to do while the boys were at school. If you look at this item over here on the etagere, that's a tarpaulin. You can move on down and move on down. So people come on into the room. Y'all paid the money to see all this stuff. I didn't. This is an etagere, and if I knew how to turn the well, we can't turn the lights on. This is a coal oil chandelier. Um, that's an etagere, or a, a, the, uh, that is an etagere. Et this is an etagere, or a whatnot shelf. Clara traveled with her husband when she let him live, and she could, would have picked up souvenirs on her travels to have on her, for things for people to talk about. Because the, during the Victorian era, they did not have, you know, they didn't have radio and television and movies and Spotify and cell phones and all that kind of stuff, but they would have had souvenirs that they picked up, and so they would have been displayed on here, and then someone coming to the home could pick up something from off the etagere, go to Clara and say, well, Clara, dear, where did this come from? And Clara would tell the story. Now, you know how that story is going to be, and you asked for it, so you're going to get this story of Clara getting that, wherever she had to go to get that souvenir. You know how it's going to be, too. I'm sure you've had people, know people like that. But what I was first starting talking about is this tartelin right here, which was made by a 10-year-old girl to show what she learned in her botany and sewing classes. This is linen and silver threads. Isn't that amazing? A 10-year-old girl made that. Isn't that amazing? Please step into the dining room. 
Now, was this house built on site here? This house right here. Okay. It was built right here. So that means it's 150 years old. 30. I'm going to have to go. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, but it's the top lock to get out. Okay. Thank you. Now, are these pocket doors, do they have glass on them? I have no clue because they've never I've never seen them closed. Really? They've yeah. always been open like this because they're not, you know. They're, no, they're uh, usually they're usually all wood. Wood doors. Usually wood. I've never seen I'm a realtor here, Pensacola. I've never seen glass in them. They're always all wood. Okay. I'm just curious because of the archway. Yeah. But you know, she knew I guess she knew somebody in the lumber industry. Yeah, and sure. was able to get whatever she wanted as far as lumber is concerned. Oh, sure. Yeah. Because if you look at the floor, you don't see any knots in that wood. Mm. Yeah, there's no, there's no knots in this wood. And I, it, it looks like like a fir or a hard pine, maybe. It might be oak down. But anyway, no, it's not oak. No, it's pine. It's pine. But anyway, the idea of a dining room is, a, is comes to us from the French. To have a room in your house that you don't do anything in but eat. Now think about this, but please don't tell me what your answer is. How many houses have you had that you had formal dining rooms and did you use it all the time? I know I've had three houses. We had formal dining rooms. We didn't don't even own final formal dining room furniture. To me, it's a waste of space to have a formal dining room if you're not going to use it every day. Put that room in the bathroom or a bedroom or a closet. Please put a closet in the house, right, where you can store stuff. But then she would have used this house. She would have entertained her guests in this house. When it was time for dinner, she would probably could have had a hired servant, or maybe one of her daughters would have come to announce dinner. She would have invited them into the into the dining room. She may have even closed these doors at that point in order to let her daughter go back into the parlor to change the items on the whatnot shelf, change books and maps that were sitting around because they needed something to talk about. They didn't, like I said, they didn't have movies to talk about or television shows or anything like that. So they talked about the items that they had that she had in the house. Now, there are two distinct styles of furnishings in this house. And one is Charles Eastlake. If you look at this chandelier, see the, the this is a coal oil or kerosene chandelier. See the, the, the filigree stuff kind of looks like maybe fanciful leaves or flowers. I don't know if you can see, this one has stag heads on it and flowers up at the top. So the Victorians were very into nature. But this is Charles Eastlake style of furnishings. Also, look at that lamp table in the corner. See the legs, all that carving on that table? Mm. That's Charles Eastlake style of furnishings. Now look at this table. Look at the feet of the dining room table. Look at the three sideboards that are in here. Look how big those feet are compared to that. Massive, aren't they? Even this table. Look how big this foot is. The feet of it. Massive, right, compared to that. This is Empire style of furnishing or Napoleonic. The china on the table is Door Family China. This is Havlin China. And there are some items on the table that you just don't see anymore, like this little glass dish. Y'all familiar with the little glass dish? Yeah. Salt cellar, right? The little salt cellar. You have your salt cellar. Personally, we've gotten their own little bit of salt. And also, this small dish is for butter. You would, each person would have gotten their own little butter dish. But this one is really strange. And this is a bone plate. Because when your entree came, and if it was on a bone, Social etiquette would be that you remove the meat from the bone, remove the bone from your plate, put it in a bone dish so that you could then eat your, eat your food, especially if you're fish, something like fish. But Clara is showing off every step of the way. Notice she has some pieces on the sideboard over there showing off. She has things to talk about right here on this sideboard. She, I bet, would have left the door open to her china cabinet so you could see she had all 12 place settings of the china. Now we do have all 12 place settings of the china. It's in another house. We, you'll see it when we go to another house. But she might do something like that just to show off because that's the way they think they did. Ladies in the Victorian era did not cut their hair. They brushed their hair. They washed their hair, but they did not cut their hair. They would save the hair from the hairbrush. All the females in the household, they would save that hair. Maybe even Miss Smith, if she was by herself next door. <coughs> Maybe even Granny Jones, you would get there, get the hair from Granny Jones. Wind that around silver threads and make hair wreaths out of them. And this is one of three that we have in the house right there. Right John Austin, a hair wreath. And if you're very interested, there is a hair wreath museum in Kansas City. If you're ever up in Kansas City and would like to see that. But this is one of three in the house. So that means that probably 90, between 95 and 100 percent of that hair is all related. Or the people the hair comes from is all related. So if you'd like to step into the hallway, there actually is another hair wreath right when you go through that door on your left hand side. Now what would they use to light these lamps? These, oh, I'm sorry, thank you for submitting that. See the little knob on the side right there? These <laughs> rotate down. This would pull down, 
So if you get to the lamps, you clean them, you light them, fill them, you know, kerosene, clean them, you know, put them out, and then put it back up. They would have to have a candle lit on all the sides over there because it switches out. That's a lot of light. Oh, a lighter. That's a lighter for a, a wind, a wind resistant lighter. It just like burns like ember on the end of the room. It's a sailor lighter, that's what they used to call it. I'm pretty sure that's what that is. Now we don't know what Clara was thinking about in this part of the hallway. We think she used this for a place for her children to, to eat. That door goes to the outside. That door there goes to the kitchen. But her two daughters did play organ at Christ Church across the street. So we have this set up as a practice area. Because you know that if her daughters were playing at church on Sunday, she was going to be in here every day, right? Listening to them practice and make sure that they didn't mess, and mess up. Because if it was door family children playing, they better be perfect. Here's another pyramid. It is not door family here, there, but it is just an awesome piece of furniture. Imagine that, that this has survived from the 1870s. The three chairs in here are door family items. These two red chairs and that green chair. Also on that green chair, there are other hair, human hair items like watch, not watch fob, but a, a chain, watch chains and things like that. It's on that um, um, chair right there. These two people right here, this is Clara's mother and father. I do not remember her mother's name. Her father's name, though, was Charles, and it's just easy to remember that since their last name was Barkley. I don't, I don't know what it is. I'd like to walk down this way because I have something here that's interesting. You just don't see it very often, so I'd like to point it out to people. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. down. Y'all paid the money. I didn't. See this blue set of, of china that's in here? You probably really recognize the type of china it is because it's blue and it has the windmill on it. It's Delft china from the Netherlands. But it's a chocolate service. And you just don't very often see chocolate services. Now, coffee and tea, you see the coffee and the tea, you see those all the time. But notice that the coffee pot and the teapot spout starts at the bottom of the urn. The chocolate urn spout is at the top of it for whatever reason. But chocolate was expensive at the time and thick, so you would only get a little bit of it at a time. I guess it was a real treat to get chocolate at the time. Well, we're gonna be going upstairs, but before we go upstairs, I'd like to talk about this gentleman right here at the base of the stairs. Now, you two young, two, two young girls, y'all might need this information in school, so you might wanna pay attention. This is very, very important. This gentleman right here is Ebenezer Dorr, which is Clara's father-in-law. Clara's father-in-law was sheriff of Escambia County. We're in Escambia County here. He was sheriff of Escambia County. The sheriff has to dole out punishments levied by the local courts. In one instance, a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Walker, so remember that, Jonathan Walker, stole seven slaves. He was caught with those seven slaves, put on trial, found guilty of stealing those seven slaves. His punishment was to have SS branded on his hand, Sierra, Sierra, branded on his hand. Ebenezer Dorr branded Jonathan Walker's hand, SS, as a slave stealer. Jonathan Walker went back up north, wrote a poem against slavery, preached against slavery, telling people that he was a slave savior, yeah. not a slave stealer, and that he could prove it. But if you need to write a, a biography, a little report about somebody, Jonathan Walker, because you don't hear about that, and there is a picture on the internet, you can find a picture on the internet of his hand, SS. Come on upstairs. set up for 1871. But it looks just like this one. It looks just like, it would look just like this. <laughs> Except for one difference. There was only one difference between that room and this room, and that is that that room had a door and a stairway to the outside. Oh. Where the girls would not have that. Because boys have to go out and do men things, and the girls have to stay home and learn how to be housewives. 
I know that's a little bit above your, your thinking, but they did. Here we are. This is the girls' bedroom. Notice how different this is, how plain this is compared to what we saw downstairs. Just paint on the walls, wooden fireplace around. The furniture doesn't match, and they don't care because the public is not going to see that this is a private sphere of the home, and so you're not going to see any of that. Uh, you, the public is not going to see this on a private sphere. <coughs> This bed is pre-Civil War. It would have had mosquito netting on it, just like you see on Mrs. Doar's bed in that room. It would have had mosquito netting on it. This is a slat bed, very similar to the rope bed that we saw in the 1805 house, in that they are wooden slats that the mattress is sleeping on. Now, this is a feather mattress, so she must have liked her girls a lot more than she uh, liked her boys. Notice that there are no screens on the windows. Screens did not come into the American culture until the 1920s. Popular in the 1950s, can you imagine? So that's why they all would have been sleeping under mosquito netting. Would you like to step into Mrs. Doris' bedroom? There is a hair wreath in here also. It looks like a flower right over here on the wall. Notice the two jib doors in this room. There's also a jib door in the next room over. This is the master's bedroom. Now, the master's bedroom is always on the southeast corner of the house because this bedroom gets all the breeze. You have the two uh, jib doors in here. You have a window. You have the three windows in the girls' bedroom. There's the, a window and a jib door in the next bedroom. There's a window in the hallway. I don't know how many windows in the boys' room since we can't go in there. But this room would have gotten all the breeze. So if you ever go to... Um, Galveston and go to down Galvez Street and see all the mansions on Galvez, Galvez Street, you'll see, they'll say, tell you the same thing, that they had, the, man, the master's bedroom is always on the southeast corner of the house. Do you know whose bedroom is on the northeast corner of the house? That's where you put your guests, because that's usually the hottest room in the house, it's the one on the northeast <laughs> corner of the house. This furniture is from 1870, it is not, it is not Clara's furniture, but it is a good example because it is mattress and box spring. She could have had mattress and box spring for herself, but it knows it all matches, but she would have been sleeping under mosquito netting. Now, gentlemen, I want to address all you gentlemen, and boys, boys, y'all need to learn, you're still kind of young, you may not understand this. Pay attention. Ladies, never, ever sweat or perspire. Never. Isn't that true, ladies? Right? Mm -hmm. Never sweat or perspire. They might sheen. They might glow. <laughs> they might glisten. But they don't sweat or perspire. Ladies in the Victorian era wore up to seven layers of clothing. Seven layers of clothing. Some of those layers were to help with that not sweating and perspiring. You can see them here on the fainting couch. They would wear these during the day, they would take them off at night, rinse them out, put them on a towel horse to dry. Because their clothing was made to fit, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So, they, so if they needed new clothing, they, they would bring a seamstress in to make this clothing. But notice how thin this waist is on this, on this model. Because the, way, the, the Victorian lady's waist had to be as close to 18 inches as possible. The next section down could be larger, and if it wasn't large enough, you would have a bustle to help your put up not be put up enough put up enough. <laughs> Any questions about anything? We do kind of have a large uh, section of people here, so if you'd like to walk through the little room right there, but I'm going to stand over here and start talking about it, because this is, we uh, don't know exactly what Clara was thinking, but we think that it should have been used as a seamstress room. So like if she did hire someone to come in and to make the clothing for people, she could have had uh, the seamstress in this room because they would have needed room for fitting and so this would have been a nice and fitting. So no, that's why we have the sewing machine in here. That sewing machine was patented in uh, 1885. But look at the foot pedal of that machine. You saw, I've never seen one uh, except for here. My grandmother had a machine like that. But it's with that kind of a pedal. Isn't that amazing? I think it's just amazing. We're going to go downstairs and out the door to go to Christ Church across the street.
across the street to the church. Oh, I forgot you. The, the uh, furniture in the sanctuary is from about 1890, so we ask you not to sit on the furniture. Otherwise, you can sit in any pew that you wish to sit in, and if the door is open, you can go into the room that, that, that the door is open. And, and if it is open, I'll invite you actually to go into that room. So you can sit where you want, I'm going to go to the front and tell you about the history of this church. Now, 1832, why was it going to 1832? Well, remember, Florida was part of Spain. So Joseph Simon arrived in 1834, all Protestant faiths worshiping in the same service at this church. He was tending to the needs of this congregation when in 1837, there was a yellow fever epidemic. He contracted yellow fever and in 1839, he died. Now, not only did they not have uh, any other Protestant churches here in Pensacola, they did not have a Protestant cemetery in Pensacola or a city cemetery. They only had a cemetery for St. Michael's Catholic Church. So they were not about to put their Anglican priest in a Catholic cemetery. So what did they do? Where did they bury the Reverend Saunders? Remember, the back of the church was here. Right here. His office was behind the church. Here, he had a separate wooden building that was behind the church. His office, separate wooden building right here behind the church. So they went into his office, picked up the floor, and they buried him in the ground right here underneath his office. Yep. Right over there. What? Yep. Next record comes Frederick Peak. Frederick Peak had children and he was interested in education. So he built the first two story building around the corner. Remember I pointed out the two story building around the corner? He built the original two story building as a public school for all the boys in Pensacola. Isn't that a shame? But, but they had children who wanted to educate. So he built a school for the kids. But in 1846, he contracted tuberculosis and he died. So where do you think they buried the Reverend Pete? Uh, right over here. In his office, picked up the floor, and they buried him in the ground underneath his office. Well, one of the reasons that they could have done that was they didn't they didn't have the right kind of cemetery, and they were also afraid of the Native Americans might give them up to do things. So the next part of the John Scott. He arrived in 1848. In 1851, the citizen bishop of London said he could become a chaplain in the U.S. Army. And the bishop said, yes, you can, but you have to give me time to find someone to, as your replacement. It took the bishop two years to find someone 
who would come to Pensacola. The beautiful downtown, always the same temperature, very cool temperature, plenty of fresh water and no strange diseases, Pensacola. David Flower, fresh out of divinity school, 31 years of age with a wife who was six months pregnant, accepted the position here in Pensacola. He was here for 10 weeks. He contracted tuberculosis, I'm sorry, yellow fever, contracted yellow fever, and he died. So where do you think they buried the I'm Reverend Ryan? Right. 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 They did what? Uh, all I know is a bad fever. It's kind of like, have you ever had the flu? Uh, yeah. Or bad cold? It's like yeah. that. But the people did not have aspirin or Tylenol or uh, uh, Benadryl or I don't know whatever you would take for that. And so well, they just died. Something. Yeah. So you you took some medicine. Well, they didn't have medicine back then. So you just died. So. Uh, John Scott comes back from being chaplain in the U.S. Army. January the 7th, 1861, the War of Northern Aggression starts. That is the day that the uh, seven states of the Union of the United States of America secede from that union and join the Union of the Confederate States of America. So the Confederate soldiers are here in Pensacola and across the, the, the uh, bay to Fort Barrancas, or Confederate. The Union forces are across the sound at Fort Pickens and on Santa Rosa Island, and it's war, and they're doing warlike things to each other back and forth, okay? You know, burning ships, having <coughs> raids back and forth, and things like that. But in May of 1862, the Confederates were told to leave Pensacola, burn everything of economic value, and that is what they do. The Reverend Scott gets his congregation together, and any of the people of Pensacola who want to go to Montgomery, Alabama, and they go to Montgomery, Alabama until they wait out to the end of the war. The Union forces come in and they use this building for a lot of things because it's one foot thick brick walls, still standing, it didn't burn. The Union forces use it as a barracks, they use it as a hospital, they even use it as a uh, prison. And finally, in the last year of the war, they used it as a chapel. But while they were using it as a prison, they kept a 16-year-old Pensacolian lad prisoner here in this church. He saw them dig up the remains of the three records over there. But remember, the Confederates burnt Pensacola so that they could, they could see the underneath the building. They dug up the three records over there looking for valuables. And I'm going to continue that story in about 110 years. It takes that long for that story to come back into play, about, a, about 110 years later. But the war ends, eventually the war ends, and of course, the, uh, uh, Reverend Scott comes back with the people of Pensacola and the congregation, and things start picking up, because this is a very good harbor, very fine harbor, well protected by Santa Rosa Island, so industry picks up here in Pensacola rather quickly. Uh, but of course, Evan Dorr passes away in 1869, and Mrs. Dorr builds that house, and that's a nice house to be building, to have built in, in 1870, 1871. But that's an example of how things are picking up here in, in, in Pensacola. So by 1879, Reverend Scott, who is still here as rector of the church, comes before the vestry and tells the vestry, we need to do something to this building. It's now 47 years old. It needs a little TLC. It went through the war, the ravages of war. Let's do something to fix it up. So they raised $4,500 again, and they did to this building what you see today. They had a flat roof. They took that flat roof off and they did that in 1879. They took this west wall out and moved it out to 20 feet. They put stained glass windows in all of these windows. When the church moved in 1903, they took those stained glass windows with them to the new church. They are still being used in the new church. The bell tower was wooden. They took that wooden bell tower down and put up a brick bell tower. Oh, gas lighting. Gas lighting had come into vogue. And so they cut the fuse and put them into this design and put this wall up that hides the gas pipes to feed the gas lamps light. Now these are electric, and I'm going to tell you why they are electric in just a minute. But those are some of the things that they did in 1879 and 1891. They added the two rooms, the rector's study and the uh, choir's room. This building originally was whitewashed. Now, right now it has an industrial strength coating on the outside of it. The bricks don't like to stay standing on top of each other like this. They like to be laying flat on the ground. So this building is crumbling. It's falling down the ground. They have an industrial strength coating on the outside to help hold it together. But if you would like to see the whitewashed wall of the church, go through that door and turn around. You go anytime you wish, go through that door, turn around, look, and you'll see the whitewashed wall from 1891. Um, 
1903, things had changed here in Pensacola. A lot of things had changed here in Pensacola. People had moved to the East Hill and North Hill sections of the city. The only trolley line in Pensacola at the time was on Palifax Street, which is about four blocks away. So can you imagine ladies dressed like you just saw in Mrs. Gore's house, walking from the trolley line here in like September, you know, July, August, September. I'm sure when the vote came before the vestry, do we build a new church on the trolley line? Every husband knew exactly how to vote. And so they built a new church and where the other, all the other major religions were building a, a houses of worship in the same area. And so they just went over there and, and joined the others. They leased this building to an Episcopal congregation of color who stayed in this church until 1928. They then got out of the lease. This, uh, during the Depression years, there was a lady here, one of the last people baptized in this church, her last name was Abercrombie, uh, used her own money to keep the building sound. Repair broken windows, fix leaking roof, things like that. Just prior to World War II, she got the church together with the city and got the city to lease this building and use it as a public library. And they did that until about 1959. The building needed repairs, the city did not want to do it do those repairs, and so they got out of the lease. Miss Abercrombie came back into play. She got the church to donate the building to the Pensacola Historical Federation, and they used it as a museum and archives until between 90 and 95. I don't remember the exact date, but sometime in that era. Well, in 1995, it became part of the University of West Florida Trust. The trust is a political entity, and they petitioned the state for money. They got $500,000 from the state. They raised $300,000, and they rejuvenated this building back to this 1879 grandeur that we had. Now, when the city took over this building to use it as a public library, they took everything out of the building and threw it away. All the pews, the gas lamps, communion rail, everything, just took it and just threw it away. These are all duplicates. Everything, is, everything had to be remade. Isn't that amazing? But, but that's what they did back then. The only thing, the altar. The altar went to three different Episcopal churches in the state of Florida, and during the rejuvenation work between 95 and 2002, the rector of the church at the time did the research, found all those churches, and had it redonated back to this building. Isn't that awesome that, he had, that they did that? Now, the 16-year-old Pensacolian lad, I told you, that uh, found, saw the three, uh, th saw the Union soldiers digging up the three rectors right over there. He told his daughter that story. His daughter told Miss Abercrombie that story. Miss Abercrombie told the rector of the church. He got the archaeological department of the University of West Florida to come out. They did ground seismic work underneath the church and on the grounds around the church. They found the remains of the three rectors over there, exhumed those remains, studied them for two months, made coffins for them out of cedar, and had a, call, a funeral for them here in this church using the Book of Common Prayer of 1768. So they are still buried in a vault underneath the church just right over there. Are there bones over there? Who lives over there? Who? Are there bones over there? Are there bones over there? Yes, they are. But we can't see them because they're, in the, they're locked in the vault. I the bones would go away by then. Well, it depends on how you, how you, what happens. If you have them in the dirt, they could, yes. If you just have them straight in the dirt. But these are not in dirt. These are in, in boxes, in wooden boxes. And they're not in the dirt. But if you, they could go, eventually they would go away if they're injured, eventually. It would take a long time still for your bones to go away, though, because they have bones thousands and thousands of years old. That's still viable bone. Any other questions? That's a good question. Oh, this stained glass. Uh, Miss uh, Abercrombie died in, 18, in 1981. And um, L.B. Godwin picked up the torch for this church from her. He was very instrumental in the rejuvenation work done in the church between 95 and 2002. His children donated this stained glass in his memory for the rejuvenation of the church, I mean, which is an awesome thing. First of all, to have that, <coughs> that uh, <coughs> sign, that, that window, you know, of Christ knocking on the door wanting, wanting to come into your house. But the other thing is to imagine, would your children donate something like that in your memory? I, mean, I don't think mine would. Just the way it goes. Any other questions about anything? Does anybody have yes. the time? What time is it? It's about 15 after 12. We have one more house to go in and we have 15 minutes. So if you want to see the whitewashed walls, you can go through that door right there and look. Otherwise, let's go, let's move on.
six times? Yeah. That, that's all I have. This archaeological plaque talks about the ground seismic work that I talked about underneath the church and on the area around the church. You can come back and read it because it talks about the Spanish era, the, the American era, the British era, and all that. But we're going to this house right here. But uh, they sold the house, I guess, as part of the divorce proceedings. But in 1897, it was purchased by Benito Rushclave. Uh, he was one of 13 children. He was born in Mississippi. I'm going to talk more about him when we go in. Um, this is 4,000 square feet, though. This house is 4,000 square feet. It's a single family home. There are five bedrooms upstairs. He was one of 13 children. <laughs> As I mentioned, Benito Rushclave bought this house in 1897. He was one of 13 children. The other 12 were all female. He was the last Rush Clavet heir at the time. This is the 
His mother and father moved here when he was quite young. They had the toll bridge over Big Bayou going to the Naval Reservation. That's how they made their money. But when he was 16 years of age, Benito's parents passed away. Both of them, within about eight months of each other, it was just one of those things that happened, though. No, Mrs. Dora was not around. It wasn't her, her doing it. But uh, they both passed away. So he quit school because he was 16. He quit school, went to work on the Naval Reservation to earn money because he felt like if he was the last Roche Bay male heir, he needed to support his sisters. There were eight of them still at home. They moved in with an older sibling who was already married. He also cut and sold a cord of firewood every day after work to make money to support his sisters. He was not above doing any job whatsoever. And we're going to talk about some of those jobs that Captain Benito did as we moved through the house. Eventually, he went to work on the waterfront, became captain of a tugboat, the tugboat Monarch. I'm going to show you a picture of the tugboat when we go through the dining room. This is his, his sea chest from the tugboat Monarch. This is the Captain Benito's sea chest. Now, this house being built in 1897 was built right at the end of the Victorian era and right before the modern era. So we're going to see things in here that are very Victorian, and we're going to see things in here that are very modern. Things that are Victorian are the number of pictures on the walls, because the Victorians put a lot of pictures on the wall. Remember I told you Mrs. Doris House? They didn't have a lot of books or pictures or you know, movies. They didn't have movies, you know, and, and cell phone and all that kind of stuff, and television and Spotify and all that kind of stuff. So they put pictures on the walls. These three pictures are right here, actually, and the two that are right around the corner here are done by a native Pensacolian by the last name of Runyon. He had a watercolor school here in Pensacola. They still, that family still is active in, the, uh, in Pensacola in, uh, in the art industry. Uh, notice when we walk into this hallway, look how big it is. Notice that the furniture doesn't match because they don't care. That's part of the new age thinking or the modern thinking. So if the furniture doesn't have to match. The Rochefort Vase would have entertained in this room. And all they worried about is, do you have a place to sit? That's what's important. They don't care what it looks like. You know, it doesn't match. Do you have a place to sit? Move into, like to step into the parlor. Notice in the part, here we are on the part, notice that the, again, the furniture doesn't match, and they don't care about that. That's not what's important now. The important thing is, again, is people have a place to sit. But this house was built with jib doors in it also. You see the two jib doors here? There are, I don't know how many there are upstairs. There's one in the hallway. We're going to look at the one in the hallway when we come through the house. So you can see, we'll talk more about that one there. But like I said, the captain built this house in 18, bought this house, excuse me, in 1897. In 1898, there was a little dust-up that started in the Caribbean. We call it the Spanish-American War, right? Captain Benito became part of the Spanish-American War. Someone came to the captain and said, hey, captain, you want to make some extra money? I said, sure, I just bought this house. I don't mind making extra money. What do you want me to do? They said, nothing much. Look, you have your tug, but we want you to go to Cuba. Take some things to Cuba for us, okay? Some people, some food, some guns, some ammunition for the Spanish side. He earned $24,000 for that, which was like a million and a half dollars in today's economy. He wanted to do that again because he made so much money, but for some odd reason, our Navy said, no, we don't want you to do that. They captured him in his boat. They made him spend a year as a dredge tender here in the, in the Pensacola Harbor with a customs agent on board so he wouldn't be bad. But really, he got off scot-free, right? He knew people in high places. He got off scot-free because if you're running guns for the enemy in time of war, Yes, you would have been shot or hanged or something like that, absolutely. Oh, just as a side note, let me ask you this. We're talking about the Spanish-American War. Coca-Cola was developed in 1886. It went to the Spanish-American War with our soldiers, with our army. What did they do with it? Come on now. Yes? Use it as medicine? They did use it as medicine. Very, very, y'all, you are so close. You are absolutely close. They mixed it with rum and developed the Cuba Libre, or rum and coke. We know it as rum and coke. <laughs> Good medicine. Good medicine. <laughs> uh, this is a picture of the, of the thing of the uh, Maine warship Maine. Maine was sunk in Havana Harbor, and Captain uh, the, our Navy went on to the Maine to retrieve everything of economic value off of the Maine. They took everything off of the Maine that they could, so they could reuse it. They could recycle it. Captain Benito ended up with some of those items. If you look at the top shelf of the etagere. 
which is a Victorian idea. If you look at the top shelf of the etagere, you see those wine glasses on that top shelf inside the etagere? Each one is etched USN. They are from the officer's mess of the US Main. Again, Captain Vidget to a new people, and so he ended up with some of their wine services. What's in the jar on the second shelf? Go see what's in the jar on the second shelf. Ladies, so y'all go see. What's in that jar? The head? Yes. A shrunken head. Remember, the Victorians needed things to talk about. Some sailor on his trips around the world found that shrunken head and brought it back to the captain for him and his family, something to talk about. Now, it's not real. It's a piece of goat skin sewn to look like a shrunken head, but it is real. Uh, but it's something for them to talk about, like the tusks at the bottom. They're not real either, but it's something to talk about. You know, they, they need things to talk about. Now, you notice they have a library in here because books were cheaper. At the turn of the century, books were cheaper, and so they could have had a library here in the house. There are some first editions in here. I just don't know. I don't remember what they are. Another item, though, is that violin that's on the mantelpiece. That violin was made by a sailor, somebody that knew the captain, and knew the captain had five children. He and Kathleen had five children, four girls and two boys, and he made that violin for the captain, and they made, he made it out of a cigar box. Can you imagine? And they didn't know anything about the Suzuki method of violin <laughs> learning. The ship at the top? We have that ship at our house. Yeah. You have a ship like that at your house? That's, yeah, the, that's the Cuddy Sark. The Cuddy Sark was the last three masted schooner that um, plied the waters off the east coast of the United States. So that's, that's what's important about that. But if you'd like to step into the dining room, Now here, in this dining room, the Rushville days are not going to use this dining room like Mrs. Dore used her dining room. Mrs. Dore used her dining room to show off, to entertain her guests. The Rushville days, middle class family, they could not afford to have this room and not use it every day. So you can imagine, that after dinner was cleared away, the children might be sitting around the table doing their homework. During the day, Kathleen might have her sewing laid out on the table and cutting out patterns. You know, she's going to be using this room, but at dinner time, now this is the new age thinking. At dinner time, and you're here in the house, you're now part of the family, here's a plate, grab a chair, sit at the table, and you're gonna eat. I mean, that's, that's the new age thinking. Mrs. Doris' house, no, if you were not invited, you would not be in the house. You would certainly not be sitting down at a meal. But if you were in the house, you're now invited automatically to the dinner to have a meal. The picture above the mantelpiece is of the tugboat Monarch. And you, sir, mentioned in Mrs. Doris' house, as you have here, the ceiling height. You know why? For the heat. For the heat, because the heat goes up. So the windows are double sash. So you lower the top sash of the window and lower the bottom sash. Yeah, lower the top sash, raise the bottom, and it's like a vacuum. And the heat goes out the, the top of the window, and the coal is sucked in the bottom. Heat goes out the top and sucked in at the bottom. So that's why we have uh, such large windows that have high roofs so the, because the, the uh, heat goes up. So I'd like for you to step through the parlor, through the hallway up there. Pay attention to Butler's Pantry. There are some new age items in the Butler's Pantry that's going to be a test. Do you recognize anything in there as new? A modern convenience? Fire. <laughs> What's that black tubular thing? Is that vacuum, vacuum cleaner. It's a vacuum cleaner. Can you imagine that tubular, yeah, that tubular thing with the two wooden handles at the top of it is a vacuum cleaner. Can you imagine walking around going? But other than that, hand propelled. Hand right. propelled, but that's yes. exactly right. Mm -hmm. They also, there's a um, Pillsbury Doughboy cookie jar in there. There's a tin of uh, Quaker oats. There's a box of ivory snow. <laughs> Not ivory flakes. And there's a difference between the two, ivory snow, and there's also a bar of octagon soap in there. If you're familiar with, I never used it. What's that? What would you put in hot water? I don't know. Another modern convenience is what we're standing on. Linoleum. Linoleum came to the American culture right after the turn of the 1900s. So this house could have had linoleum in it. 
Look at this modern convenience. It's right here. <clears throat> Have you had there? Do you have one at home? <laughs> no. An ice box? Right? Yeah. Ice box. Ice box. Ice box. Yeah. Uh, man, put your hand with a placard that's right there on the back. <clears throat> so the ice man would be coming to the house and you would put this up. However, how much ice you think you needed. Do you need 50 pounds of ice, 75 pounds of ice? You would put the number up and in the window, and then he, the ice man, would bring that amount of ice into the house. Uh, to put in your ice box. Now, do all the young people understand how the ice box works? Let's talk about how does an ice box, well, are you sure? <laughs> how does an ice box work? Because I had a young lady on the tour that knew how the ice box worked. So the ice is brought in big blocks, big, like 25 pound blocks, and they put it up here in this top piece. And then they put the food in this part right here, but it must be locked, I can't get it. They would put the food down here, then there would be a pan at the bottom, because there's a hole in the top pan, there would be a pan on the bottom that would collect the water, and then they would have to take that water out, that take the pan out, and go and throw the water out. Because the ice, the heat, the cool from the ice goes down, the heat comes up, just like in this room. And so you, they put the ice in the top because it goes down to keep the things cool. Look at this nice stove to be cooking on, a nice cold stove to be cooking on. I mean, this is a big difference in being having a, a, an outside wood burning stove. This house was built with running water. Sorry. That's why this, the sink is in here. There's a bathroom upstairs. It has plumbing, indoor plumbing. Can you imagine having a house with indoor plumbing? I mean, that's such a modern convenience to have indoor plumbing. Now, I probably went right out to the bay, but you know. And I bet you all have one of these at home also. No? You don't think? Yeah, I bet you do. You take coal from the stove and put the coal in this, get coal from the stove, burning coal, put it in here. This box is metal lined. Put this in here. It's a space heater. Like if you're sewing in another part of the house or maybe take it to church to keep you warm in the pew, it's a space heater. That's all it is, a little space heater. Can you imagine? Because you remember ladies at the time still had those long skirts on. So if they're doing their sewing, they could put their feet on that, help keep them warm. Any other questions about anything in here? Then you'd like to step across the hallway. There's a little room across the way. Now, was the running water added after the house was built? No, no. The house was built with running water and indoor plumbing. Wow. Yes. Now, was it only cold running water? Mm, probably. That's good. Now, this, house, this room right here, uh, we don't know what the original owner was thinking about when he built this room, but the Broche Blavage used it as an office slash sewing room. The captain having a tugboat and needing to... One of the other jobs that he did with this tugboat is he realized that people like to go to Santa Rosa Island to go to the beach, so he bought a barge and built a pier and a pavilion at on Santa Rosa Island, and he would take people across the sound to the island so they could go to the beach as a concession. He had a concession. To, to, you can step into the room, sir, and take pictures. You can step in there. The Rush Malays were Catholic. They were married at St. Michael's Church right here in Pensacola. We had a sick call set here in the hallway to show that they were Catholic. If I need to explain it, we say. A little sewing machine. Explain it. <coughs> sick call up. So they were Catholic. My parents had the exact same sick call set. The exact same one. And so what it is, are y'all familiar with the sick call set? Well, Catholics would have this in their home, and inside of it they would have candles, holy oil, holy water, lemons. So when the priest came, because when did we start sending our older people to the nursing home? Yeah. 65, 70, was starting to be common, you know. And so before that they stayed at home, they moved in maybe, moved in with the sibling, moved in with the oldest daughter, oldest child, or something like that. And so they would have needed things in the home because the priest would be called to administer the last rites at any time, day or night, and he may not bring those items with him. So the family would keep them in the home to have when the priest came. And so it's called the sick, S-I-C-K, call, T-H-L-L. -L. Yeah. And my parents had the exact same, the exact same one. Here's pictures of the Rush Bay family here on the wall. Uh, you can see the whole family sitting on the stoop of uh, Catherine and Kathleen with their six children and six uh, in-laws and at the time. This is Kathleen here in this center picture. Notice that there's children's toys all over the place here on this floor. Oh, that's children were playing with the adults, uh, playing while, it's, while the adults were talking. Because that's a new age of thinking, is to be, be with everybody, everybody all together in the same room. 
Now I mentioned the Jim Jordan in this house. You can use see this Jim Jordan. And to go over there and look at it, because it's actually a pocket in the wall for that bottom sash to go up and be in that pocket. It's amazing that they built this house, a middle class family home, with that kind of uh, architecture, with that kind of building. I mean, it's just amazing that they, that they did that. Just to help, just to help cool the house, because they needed every breeze that they could that they could get. So there are three things, three, uh, three things I'd still like to pass on to y'all before you leave. One is that however many museums they told you that there are for you to go into, there's one less than that. Because unless you have a child under the age of whatever it is, 12 or 13, you cannot go in the children's museum. You have to have a child under a certain age to go in the children's museum, and husbands don't count. The next thing is that there's a direct relationship between this house and the first house we went into. The first house we went into in 1805 was built by Charles Lovelace. This house was purchased by Benito Rushblavay. Charles Lovelace had seven children by Mariana Bonifay. One of those children was Julian. Julian was Benito Rushblavay's great-great-grandfather. So there's just a connection between the two houses. And the last thing I want to say is thank you. My wife actually wants to say thank you because I'm here doing this and I'm out of her house. <laughs> and she's doing Thank whatever you. it is that she, that she wants to do. So any questions about anything that I've seen so far? Okay, bud. Thank you so much.